Good morning, Michael here, and today we're trying to wrap up Job 24, and we're going to be again using the commentary from the Enduring Word, and we're going from verse 13 to 25, so let's begin from verse 13 to section 17, the seem insecurity of the wicked. <laughs> The deeds done in darkness. Let's read. There are those who rebel against the light. They do not know its ways, nor abide in its path. The murderer rises with the light. He kills the poor and needy. And in the night he is like a thief. The eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight, saying, No eye will see me. And he disguises his face. In the dark they break into houses, which they marked for themselves in the daytime. They do not know the light, for the morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. If someone recognizes them, they are in the terrors of the shadow of death. A. They are those who rebel against the light. In powerful poetic image, Job describes the kind of sin that happens under the cover of darkness. Darkness is used as a cloak for the murderer, the thief, and the adulterer. It was almost as if Job anticipated the latter instruction from the Apostle Paul. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in the lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its loss. That was from Romans thirteen twelve to 14 For the morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. One should regard the morning as something good, the coming of light after the dark night. Yet for these wicked people, morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. It is a bad thing to them, not a good thing. Clark made special application of this to the adulterer. The morning dawns, but it is to him as the shadow of death, lest he should be detected before he can reach his own home. And if one know him, if he happens to be recognized in coming out of the forbidden house, the terrors of death seize upon him, being afraid that the thing shall be brought to light, and that he shall be called to account, a sanguinary account, by the injured husband. So verses 18 to 21, what should happen to the wicked? There should be swift on the face of the waters. Their portion should be cursed in the earth, so that no one would turn into the way of their vineyards. As drought and heat consumes the snow waters, so the grave consumes those who have sinned. The womb should forget him. The worm should feed sweetly on him. He should be remembered no more and wickedness should be broken like a tree. For he preys on the barren who do not bear, and does no good for the widow. Their portion should be cursed in the earth. Job wondered why God did not judge the wicked as he should. Here it is as if Job gave God advice on how he should judge the wicked. Mainly he should do it in his life, and not wait until after the life beyond cursed in the earth. The worm should feed sweetly on him. He should be remembered no more. Job wasn't against the idea of the wicked being punished after death. He simply didn't want the punishment to begin there. He thought it should begin in this life, <laughs> and he continued afterwards. He prays on the barren who do not bear. The barren wife was considered more helpless than the widow as the latter might have sons to help her. So verse 22 to 25, the seeming security of the wicked. But God draws the mighty away from his power. 
he rises up, but no man is sure of life. He gives them security, and they rely on it, yet his eyes are on their ways. They are exalted for a little while, then they are gone. They are brought low. They are taken out of the way like all others. They dry out like the heads of grain. Now if it is not so, who will prove me a liar and make my speech worth nothing? Eh, but God draws the mighty away from his power. Job here considered that perhaps the fate of the wicked in the world beyond was retribution enough for the scales of divine justice. Yes, the wicked seem to prosper in this life, he rises up. Yet at the same time, no man is sure of life. In these verses, Job sounds almost like the ass in Psalm 73. He was troubled at the prosperity of the wicked until he went into the house of God and understood their end. If God does not, Job does not counter the friends by a one-sided exaggeration of his own, claiming that God is hostile to the upright and an accomplice of the crooked. His position is more balanced, but more baffled. He simply cannot see how God's justice works out in his own case. He gives them security and they rely on it, yet his eyes are on their ways. Job reminded himself that God was not blind to the sins of the wicked, and even if they did pro seem to prosper well enough in this life, soon enough then they are gone and they are brought low. The sense from Job is that God allows such prosperity to some of the wicked to increase their ultimate judgment. He does indeed give them security, and they do rely on it, but they end up as dry heads of grain. In the east, they generally reap their harvest by just taking off the tops of the ears of corn and leaving the straw. Thus will the wicked be cut off. Now if it is not so, who will prove me a liar? Job challenges all men to contradict what he affirms, that the righteous may be great, su greater sufferers and the wicked may for a while prosper, but that God will, in the end, overthrow the ungodly and establish the righteous. So that is it for 24. <laughs> it is indeed a difficult chapter. And uh, you really should uh, <laughs> open the Bible. <laughs> Dust it off first. Open the Bible. <laughs> get to Job 24. <laughs> I get a sense of what I'm saying here, man. It's, it's a lot of <laughs> disconnected points. Uh, but there is sense in it. There's sense in it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I too, like Job, would love to see the wicked punished in this life and not just when they transition to the other's side. <laughs> I know hell awaits them, <laughs> but I want to see their hell on earth too. Well, our judgment resides with God the Father. God, our King, our Lord, our Savior. I trust this might have been enlightening to you, uh, Job 24. Uh, this is Michael here, declaring once more, Jesus is Lord!